Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of our Transatlantic Conversation. For nearly three years, we've enjoyed the privilege of hosting Association Transformation for the international membership community. Over nearly 40 hours and 70 plus episodes, we've hosted more than 100 guests from the UK, the USA, Australia, South Africa, and many points in between. Regular listeners will know that over the years, we've covered a huge variety of topics, from change management, leadership relationships and four-day weeks, to financial strategy, income generation, and modern governance practice. And of course, who could possibly forget the unicorns and the puppy dogs episode? We really hope you enjoy every episode, and while we will always make our content freely available, remember, subscribe wherever you get your favourite pods. If you would like to lend us your support, you can do so by subscribing to the pod from as little as $5 a month. Now, hopefully it goes without saying that Elisa and I and the whole Association Transformation production team will appreciate your generosity and your ongoing support. To subscribe, visit patreon.com forward slash association transformation and choose the monthly subscription level that suits you best. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash association transformation. And remember, whatever you're up to today, put your members and your mission first. Enjoy the pod. Well, hello. This is a very interesting and different episode. I'm, I'm quite excited. Um, once again, sadly, for those of you who love the accent, um, and maybe a good thing for me, um, since he always, <laughs> he's my ultimate contrarian. Um, Andrew is, is not with us today, but I think we more, more than make up for it with um, our stellar cast of, uh, of guests this, uh, this morning. It's, it's, it's the ladies party today. Um, we, will, we will say that. Um, I'm excited to be joined for this episode of Association Transformation by the, I don't know, infamous is the right word, but I feel like you're a, a real pillar, Elizabeth, in this, in this industry. Elizabeth Engel, Chief Strategist with Spark Consulting. I was actually going through your LinkedIn and realized just how long you have been an expert in this field. Not that, I mean, I know you started when you were 12, but this is, uh, it was, it was impressive. I, I didn't think of you as, uh, as such a, a long-term piece in, in the association world, but thank you for, for all you've contributed and all you continue to advance. Um, we are also joined uh, today by Shelly Alcorn, the CEO of Michelle Alcorn and Associates. Shelly, hello. Thank you for joining us. I'm inspired by your color and your background and, and all the things that make you you that unfortunately our, our, our audience doesn't get to enjoy. But we've got three bright and beautiful ladies this morning. Well, I guess I included myself there. In that and why not? That's, that's, that's legitimate. Not. That's legitimate. That. Yeah. <laughs> what the heck? So, Elizabeth Shelley, thank you for joining us. Andrew sends his regards, but welcome to the Association Transformation family. Well, thank, thank you very much for having us. We are very excited to be here today to talk about climate change. <laughs> da, 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 da. I know. I, you know, it's one of those topics that. Um, I, Obviously, associations aren't talking about enough. That's why you all are are drawn to and and what you're doing. Um, and you know, I don't want to put uh, you know a, an an you know we need to be serious about certain things, and, and we're taking a certain lighthearted approach to to this conversation as we do with with every association transformation episode. But you know, this is serious stuff, and and we're at a place of inflection. For a lot of organizations, now is the time to, I don't want to say get ahead of it, we're, we're quite behind in terms of this, uh, this conversation, but for associations, why is now the time, why is now so urgent to um, really pull your head out of the sand? I'm just going to say it. <laughs> Shelly, let me start with you because I, I did start with you when I when I had the opportunity to read your article in Association Evolve uh, about climate change and about um, the urgency in this in this space. 
what, uh, where does it start with for you and, and why is now so important for, for associations to get, to get engaged on this conversation? Um, I, I, like anything, learning about climate change uh, is a process. <laughs> and I had for many years heard the headlines, sort of read the articles, sort of had a, a base awareness of where we were at. Um, and, but uh, in the last five years, um, I really started digging in deep on the research, um, sparked by a number of the reports coming from the IPCC, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from the United Nations, and other scholars, and realizing that the window has actually been closing for a long time. I mean, climate science has been with us since the late 1800s. This isn't a new argument. Um, it's simply the fact that we have not, as of yet, taken it seriously. And we've gotten to a point where, as the IPCC just said in their latest uh, sixth assessment report, um, without immediate and drastic reductions in greenhouse gas, um, we are in danger of moving across the tipping point of 1.5 within the next few years. So it is wow. it is an emergency that is here. Uh, and it's something that as individuals, we have trouble figuring out what we can do. Um, and Elizabeth and I feel that what we can do is talk to the association community, which is a collection of individuals, to really start using the power that associations have to make a significant difference. So that was sort of my track. Elizabeth, feel free to jump in sort of with your with your track. Yeah, you know, just to Shelley's point, um, climate science and and what we know about changing climate is not new. Um, you know, certainly, as, as Shelley points out, um, you know, this this first was proposed or talked about um, by a woman scientist um, in in the 1800s, you know, in the, in the 19th century, um, and you know, at that time, I, of course, you know, it, you're not you're not seeing any sort of effects of it really. But by the the, the 1960s, we were, you know, scientists knew by the 1960s that something was going on here that was not normal. Um, and for me, the first time that I really, that, that climate change became a part of my kind of ongoing consciousness was when I saw An Inconvenient Truth in the theater in 2006 when it was, re when it was, was introduced, uh, when it was released. Oh my gosh, um, was it that long ago? Wow. It was, it was, yes, 17 years ago wow. um, that it was, that it was released. And at the time you know, that's, there's the famous, you know, graph that Al Gore shows where, you know, all of a sudden he gets in the, the cherry picker and is like, ah, and the, you know, you watch the, the carbon emissions, woo, go, you know, shooting up and all this kind of thing. Um, and at the time, even 17 years ago, it, it all felt like it was so far off in the future. And, and I think that's, that's been one of the challenges for human beings is like, oh yeah, sure. This is the thing, but it's going to happen in 50 years. It's hard for me to think about something that far away. You know, and to Shelley's point, um, not anymore. <laughs> this is no longer, you know, a 50-year or 25-year horizon. This is something that is going to happen and is happening now. Um, and, and the, you know, the sort of, one of the things that, that is, that happens with, with climate change, if you, if you get into learning more about the science, is this whole idea of cascading effects. Um, and the cascading effects are starting to happen now. And all of a sudden, there's more of a recognition, I think, I hope, um, about the urgency of this, that, you know, we don't have 50 years to start thinking about this. We don't have 25 years. We don't have 17 years. We got to think about this stuff now. Um, and, you know, so as, as Shelley pointed out, the, the, the world, the community that the two of us are in is the association community. Associations exist. People want to associate uh, because there's some sort of a problem going on or a goal that they have that they want to solve or they want to achieve and they can't do it by themselves. So they come together in a group and associate to address that. I can't really think of any bigger challenge for humans to take on in groups right now 
than climate change. You know, and for me, as, as an association professional like yourselves, that makes a lot of sense in the philanthropic or the charity sense or the, the social issue uh, type organization. But when I'm thinking about a membership society or even a trade association, how do you make the, you know, how do you, how do you <laughs> shake them and, and tell them that this is relevant to them as well? Well, in fact, it's industries and professions that are going to have to deal with this. Uh, in short, I mean, that's, that's sort of the most obvious thing is, you know, one of the things that, that is, is quite apparent, or it should be apparent, is individual action matters. I mean, certainly, you know, putting solar panels on your house is great, and, you know, be, buying an EV or reducing the amount of, uh, you know, travel that you do, particularly air travel, green roofs, rain gardens, you know, all that stuff that's, you know, reduce your meat consumption. Sure, yeah, that's all great. Individual action cannot fix this problem. Um, you know, that's, that's, it's really nibbling around the edges. It's going to require a, a much larger scale effort. And of course, part of that is governments. Um, and part of that is, uh, you know, uh, multinational organizations like the UN, um, you know, or non-governmental organizations. But a big part of human organizing is professions and industries. And really, it's about making the economic case, I think, when you're talking to um, associations who are, why does this affect me? Aren't there nonprofits, C3s that are dealing with this? Right. And, and the idea is, well, it is affecting you right now. Um, it's affecting you in terms of manufacturing. For example, heat waves in China last year shut down their manufacturing because they didn't have enough air conditioning. And now there's a shortage of parts in the automotive industry and the computer industry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the reasons why the United States is beginning to onshore a lot of its manufacturing as opposed to offshore is because of these kinds of disruptions. These massive storms that are coming through are decimating cities. Um, the economic costs there to the industries and professions who are trying to recover, the business interruptions that are happening because of that, the risks that you're running when you're scheduling a conference for Miami <laughs> in hurricane season, not Fort, real bright. Or know, Fort Lauder or Fort Lauderdale last week. Fort Lauderdale yeah. last week, two feet of rain, you know, in, in a short amount of time that shut down their airport. So this is not only a human catastrophe, but it is a financial and economic catastrophe. And those associations who believe that they are immune to problems with manufacturing or transportation or delivery of goods. We have shortages now of medicines. We have shortages of Adderall. We have shortages of albuterol. We have shortages coming from all, all, all uh, sectors. Um, and it's bringing that story out to associations that I think is compelling beyond just, I mean, you should be concerned about the humanitarian <laughs> crisis that we're having. But just in terms of economic costs, those are rising every single day. I think so. of a, a, you know, an association executive who has taken a magazine virtual, you know, no longer print publishes, and is trying to make some of those small and incremental steps, mm -hmm. asking themselves, what else do you want? What else can I do? What is that first step for us to... I guess, recognize the problem and bring it to, you know, put it, shine a spotlight and, and what else can we do? What, what's realistic and, and ex acceptable? Mm -hmm. Well, there, there are at least sort of three angles of the way this is going to be affecting associations, right? One is, has to do with our own internal operations, you know, and that's when you think about things like your office space and your employees commuting. And, you know, the, the kind of the climate impact of all of that stuff, then, you know, at least to your point, there's also that kind of member facing piece of it, where we start talking about programs, products and services. Now, obviously, something like, you know, are you are you mailing a print publication or not? That has an impact. But really, the the main thing there that or not the main thing, the the biggest climate impact thing that associations do is in person gathering. Um, and I think we're all aware of that. Um, you know, so there's there's sort of thinking about that as well, both from the perspective of what's the, 
you know, what's the carbon emission impact of bringing a bunch of people from all over the country or all over the world together in one place. And also, you know, to Shelley's point about, um, uh, you know, did you, you know, did you set your meeting in Miami during hurricane season or in Fort Lauderdale last week or in, um, you know, uh, somewhere in sort of the Tahoe area as the atmospheric river has been coming through and dumping feet and feet and feet and feet of snow. Uh, you know, you, there's 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 the, the economic piece of well, what happens if your meeting gets canceled, um, you know, and, and we saw some of the challenges, you know, we all think, oh, I have meeting cancellation insurance, right? And we also some of the challenges with that with the pandemic. That doesn't always cover everything you think it's going to cover. Um, you know, and then at, at sort of at that, that third leg of this stool for associations is about the professions and industries we serve. You know, so so there are multiple lenses through which we need to view this and think about it that, and think about the kind of impact that we can have as organizations. It's it really starts with strategy. It really starts with just overhauling your strategic plan yeah. and thinking more about what the future has in store. Um, and not, not in the way we've traditionally done strategic planning, which is sort of, oh, what are we going to do to change membership? You know, it's like, it's like your strategic plan really needs to be about strategy and adaptation moving forward. Um, you, we have lobbyists everywhere in the U.S. But, you know, you can't throw a rock without hitting a lobbyist in Sacramento, right? We or DC. Do, well, yeah, exactly. In DC, we have the ability to deploy our lobbying teams on climate change as an economic issue in a way that C3s and charities do not have. Um, we have resources to, to ensure that we're communicating messaging out. Um, we can look at our sponsors and our affiliates. Look at your corporate sponsors. If you're being sponsored by Exxon, maybe that's not a sponsorship you should continue taking. You know, maybe you should start making values-based decisions on different elements that you have in order to try and push the needle uh, as much as you can. So there are a lot of practical things associations can do, but it really starts with that strategy, with that what is our government affairs program about? And then how are we going to live a values-based uh, life? Well, I, that's really what, what it comes down to. I think the, the, the theme of all of this is, is values-based decision-making. Mm -hmm. And when you're, when you're managing a board, do you wait for this to be urgent and important to them? How do you, as an association executive who are driving the mission and serving the the organization and, and working for the board, mm -hmm. how do you seed that field in an appropriate way? It, executives are always trapped in this idea uh, that they are here to, to simply serve the will of the board. And although that's true, what the executives can do is they can provide information to their board um, in an educational way to allow the board to come along and ask those hard questions that need to be asked. Um, it's always a matter of getting to the personal and using concrete examples of things that are happening in other industries and professions. So CEOs, and I, I am currently trying to figure out how to provide that kind of intelligence on an ongoing basis that CEOs can use to send to their boards as informational pieces um, and hopefully begin to drive the needle there. Um, it's It has to be a meeting of the minds, but we cannot wait for our boards to figure that out. They are not going to figure it out on their own. And there are a lot of climate activists, probably inside your association, who have never seen the opportunity to start the conversation. And so setting up task forces or future forces to sit and look at those practical things that will happen in your industry and profession is also a non-threatening way <laughs> to sort of start the conversation. And the more they learn, the more they're able to share, the more change you can create inside your organization. To the And to the point that both of you are making about the this concept of values, one of the values of an association is the economic viability of the industry or profession the association uh, represents. 
and there's an opportunity for leadership here, uh, you know, for, for associations to truly exercise leadership within our industries, within our professions, around how is this going to affect our economic viability? I mean, you know, we look at, I, I'm going to call them out a little bit here, but right, but we look at fossil fuel industries, whether it's, you know, petroleum or coal or whatever, and we're like, oh, well, you know, the, the, the impact there is kind of obvious, right? Um, but, I mean, any industry that you can think of, because climate disruption is going to affect every area of our lives, every industry, every profession that you can think of is going to be impacted. Some of them are going to be impacted in a really positive way. If you're in solar power or wind energy, you're in boom times, and that's likely to continue. But that's also an opportunity for leadership. Um, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, healthcare, right? You know, we, we saw healthcare get impacted incredibly, uh, in incredibly difficult ways around the pandemic. Well, one of the things that's going to happen with climate change that is happening is there's additional zoonotic pandemics coming out, you know, that diseases coming out into the human population, I, you know, like insurance, uh, I, you know, I know any, I'm watching any, the yeah. last of us. So I'm ready. Yeah, for exactly. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm watching. Yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and we have also have to think about, you know, World Health Organization just a couple of weeks ago, while I was in a strategic planning session with an organization came out and it is clear that 40% of the global population will suffer from water insecurity by 2030. That's seven years from now. 40% of the global population will not have access to drinking water in their urban areas. Um, when you look at, I mean, and that's just massive. Think about, think about that for a second. What kind of disruption that is going to create inside a world that's deglobalizing as we speak. I mean, this is not a joke. This is absolutely serious. If you look at the situation in the southwest of southwestern United States with Lake Mead and the way the Hoover Dam, I mean, they are just 100 feet from, from Deadpool, which means 40 million Americans will be out of water and have no electricity generation from the Hoover Dam. What does that mean for California, Arizona, New Mexico, you, you, all the people in that basin? It's going to be enormous. Um, and, and those are the, the impacts that are here and that don't seem to be breaking through the consciousness of, of our citizens and our members and our associations and even our own colleagues um, so, you know, this is serious stuff and, and it's here now. Well, I think to, to Elizabeth's point, and this is what really rings true to me as a, as a consultant that serves a multitude of industries. I think whether you are in the petroleum space and you're an association of, of oil and energy companies, or you are a nursing association, or you are a teacher association, there, there's an opportunity for all of us to be a leader Mm -hmm. in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And to Shelley's point, to provide your board information so that they can ask those hard questions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can be an active board without being an activist board. Right, right. And I think, you know, I, I know, I wish Andrew was here. He would be flying the flag and, you know, shouting all the ESG from the rooftop. I'm a little more you know, middle of the road on, on that coming from the trade association side and wanting to balance the, the economics of it. This, we have to make the economic case industry by industry um, so that the value-based decisions are easier. Yeah. And it's not hard to do. It's not hard to quantify the economic costs. That's the thing. The information is there. It just needs to be brought into a format that is easily transmissible yeah. and understandable. And that's where you two come in, right? I mean, you're working to aggregate, distill, and uh, and and what's the project you are you're currently contributing to on this exact topic? Yeah, Shelley and I are are right now in the process of writing a monograph on 
um, association resilience in a time of climate change. Um, and, you know, it, it is exactly getting at all of this. You know, we're looking to lay out um, the the science in a um, a serious but not doomish kind of way, you know, where we can sort of say, look, you know, this is this is the extent of the problem that we're facing and this is the time frame in which we're facing it. Um, and then, you know, talk a little bit about some of the kinds of things that we've just been talking about here. Why is this something that associations should be concerned about, should be taking on? How, how does this affect us around some of these values based conversations, remembering that economic viability of the association industry, qua the association industry, and also of those professions and industries that we serve matters. That is a value, is to, is to, to make sure that, um, you know, uh, local, national and world economies continue to operate, um, you know, in a way that is, um, that is more in in a way that that is going to allow us to continue to operate, um, you know, as we are facing some of these these pressures related to climate change, um, and then how that's going to impact the way humans live our lives, um, and then you know the, the goal of this this monograph is to not just sort of leave you sitting there going, okay, yeah, I understand that it's a problem, and I understand that associations probably need to pay attention to it, but I don't know what to do. Yeah, what <laughs> the do, other, do? Give, give exactly. me a first step. Give me exactly. what's the low-hanging fruit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. And it's our third white paper that we've collaborated on, and I can't think of a better author uh, to work with on this. And I know that there are, there are a number of consultants in our arena who are also becoming increasingly concerned. So my hope is that by writing the white paper and by recruiting uh, a lot of our colleagues who are concerned that we can develop a consultant consortium who is who who are focused on ensuring that these types of information campaigns uh, with practical solutions uh, can be can be um, distributed uh, amongst our our peers and the, and the groups that we love. I mean, this is. It's hard to talk about climate change because you're, I'm often accused of being, you know, an apocaloptimist, if you will. <laughs> is that a word? Yeah. Is that a word? <laughs> um, but it's hard to have the conversation, but we, we need to keep having the conversation um, because eventually um, it will affect all of us. So any association that is concerned about younger members any association who's concerned about their volunteer leadership pipeline, any association who is concerned about economic viability, um, any association who is concerned about their chapters and their local people who are being hurt by these things. Um, you know, it was not just a few years ago uh, when the San Diego fires were going on and I worked for an association and we had a number of members who lost their businesses uh, due to the fire, just burned to the ground. Um, and the association had to try to figure out how to support those folks, those important members that we have uh, during the time that they were in trouble. And sort of building that local resilience is also something that associations um, really need to invest time in because these global issues always play out locally. And and so there's a, a vested interest in ensuring that you're strengthening your chapters, that you have emergency response plans in place, that you're looking at risk management. These are all things that associations do, but they haven't done it through the lens of what's actually happening right now versus what best practices were for the late 19th century you know, or the late 20th century. That is no longer the century that we're in. Shelly, I'm so glad you mentioned chapters. Um, you know, they may not have the, the capacity um, to gather data or to provide the same type of education, but they are they are going to experience all of these these same things and maybe be that much closer to them. Right. Um, so I, I appreciate that that layer that uh, that factors in. Well, ladies, I I Wish you the best on the monograph. When is that going to be out? I'd love to have you both back. Um, we'll we'll let Andrew join us next time. Um, but when can we expect this this important, exciting, and and I don't want to say sad, but you know, serious research. 
we're looking at uh, late summer. Okay, for, great. For a release okay. date. Yeah. So we're, we are, we are in the throes of writing right now. Um, we are setting up interviews with associations that are doing good work in this area to talk whether, you know, whether it's related to internal operations, to member facing programs, products and services, or to kind of larger thinking about the industry or profession. Um, you know, cause one of the, one of the things that's been true out throughout the entire collaborative white paper series that I've, that I've done while I've been running Spark for the last decade is I like to, A, you know, give you some advice about what you should actually do, um, and B, provide some examples of yeah. organizations that are doing good things in this area so you can kind of, uh, they're kind of like lighting the path. Yeah, we have to you. see it yeah, to be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, and there yeah, are so- lots, yeah, and lots of initiatives coming out. ASAE just announced they have a sustainability initiative that they're beginning to work on. We'd like to highlight the work that they're doing. There are groups on the outside, such as SDG Align, which are working on helping associations quantify what their industry and profession's impact is in terms of achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we will have lots of practical ideas and resources for associations to begin to look at um, as they as they get deeper into this unbelievable climate emergency that yeah. uh, we need to effectively deal with. Because well, we, we wanna... so look forward to this information. Uh, Elizabeth, last word. I'm, I'm just so excited for what you guys are and thankful for what you guys are putting together. Well, I think, um, you know, one of the things that I that I want to do is end on a little bit of a note of hope. Because, yes, uh, you know, let's do it. Right. Because one of the things that happens with with climate change is it just it feels so big heavy. and so, so heavy. heavy and so overwhelming that you're like, well, you know, I might as well just give up. You know, <laughs> there's nothing right. we can just do. Give me, can I have a drink already? Yeah. Right. Um, and so uh, I guess it was last year I read a book called it's 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 um sort of calling it dystopia it's neither dystopian nor nor utopian science fiction it is sort of it is sort of it's uh, utopian know, it's right it's 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 called a book called the the ministry for the future um and uh, by written by a guy named kim stanley robinson um and it, it details a lot of disruption and violence and loss and and all this kind of thing around climate change um and and the, the bad things that are probably coming our way but here's the thing yeah get to the hope part elizabeth here's the here's here's the hope <laughs> part it ends with humans adapting by relying on currently known technologies there is no like deuce ex machina who shows like no and then we discover the magic solution to everything poof and it's all fixed no the every single solution that is proposed in the book is stuff that already exists even if it's only in experimental form um you know or in sort of sort of the early theoretical stages but the point that the author makes is we're not there's not just going to be one fix here we're basically going to have to throw everything that we got at the problem Everything that we've got includes associations. Well, and that is exciting to know that we can be a part of that. We can be part of that adaptation um, it is exciting. It's, it's responsibility. And it means that these conversations need to be had and these hard questions need to be asked. Thank you both so much for, for sounding this alarm, um, for your dedication to not only this issue, but the harder task of bringing it all together and and putting it in the context of associations so that lens is something people are willing to look through and not afraid of. I thank you both for for your contributions to this. And we can't wait to have you back uh, when the monograph is out. Um, So Shelly Alcorn and Elizabeth Engel, thank you so much for joining me today. And we will let Andrew in on our party next time. Um, But uh, until then, we encourage you to uh, to make Association Transformation one of your favorites wherever you get your podcasts and put your members and your mission first.